The, um, I won't, I'll, I'll pick, the revisionism debate deals with this too, and there has been a long-standing uh, debate in anthropology, some of navel-gazing debate, about um, whether the Bushmen, who the Bushmen are, are they uh, some kind of prehistoric relic, are they an ethnotype uh, or a societal type with deep roots in prehistory, human prehistory? Are they sort of uh, an aboriginal, a toxins aboriginal, or are they social marginals that are attached to pastoral, agro-pastoral societies who have, since time immemorial, been neighbors to, to people like Bushmen. And this is actually generalized beyond Bushmen. The hunter gatherers everywhere today in the Holocene. And this is at the core of the revisionism debate, to which I'll turn again later. Are the Bushmen social marginals, or are they cultural aboriginals? Uh, and uh, this debate is, an aspect of it is the anthropological tendency to romanticize uh, to idealize, romanticize, in Rousseauian terms rather than Hobbesian terms. The other, in our case, in some studies, the Bushmen. The Bushmen have been romanticized and the, in the 20th century. Well, it started actually in the 19th century. There was uh, where some people like Le Voilà, who was a, a writer who was actually knew Rousseau, who wrote about the Bushmen in, in romantic terms, saw them as the incarnation, one of the incarnations of the noble savage. Uh, so this noble savagery has continued uh, and been actually reiterated by some writers about um, uh, Bushmen in the 20th century. The Bushmen Definitely, some of the uh, writings, especially as they featured, as the Bushmen are featured in inter-anthro texts, you know, as sharing, caring, ecotopic, uh, people with with gender equality and pacifism, uh, you know, um, there has been a tendency to to romanticize them. And this very beautiful book, which many undergraduates have read, myself included, when I was an undergrad, The Harmless People by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, has presented the Bushman, the son, in those terms. And this is what I'm looking at in this article. Um, I'm contrasting this portrayal of the Bushman as harmless people with how they were portrayed in the 19th and 18th century in the literature, with few exceptions, like Le Voilà, um, mainly as brutal savages. They were the incarnation of savagery uh, in, the, in some of the early writings. Not only was their humanity in question, i.e. they were not humans but apes, the same way the pygmies were depicted the same way, um, um, but they were considered to have no language. The click language wasn't considered to be a proper language. The clicks were simply quasi phonemes. They, they were imitations of sounds nature makes, when water drips, you know, or <laughs> monkeys chatter. So Bushmen, when they click, they use a kind of proto-language, an onomatopoeic language that doesn't really stem from human symbolic the human symbolic faculty, but simply imitating the sounds of nature and animals. S they were also considered anarchical. They were considered without debased morals. They, for example, d even missionaries like Kitcher described Bushmen, women throwing their children to lions, you know, to ward them off. Um, and um, 
no God. The missionaries all talk, talked they had no God. They worshipped the devil. You know, so there was a really, real, and then, of course, all this was reinforced, these uh, writings by earlier travelers when they gave their lectures back home in England, you know, with, with the early, early sort of slideshow <laughs> shows and talked about their experiences with the Bushmen. And then they had these human zoo exhibitions, too, you know, where they would exhibit Bushmen. Uh, that had been captured in the Kalahari, and they would be on display in, in their native dress or undress, uh, uh, ideally women uh, topless, you know. Um, all of it, all the exoticizing the other, you know, in, in spades, you know. So, and this famous or infamous case of Sarki Bartman, the uh, Bushman, Hottentot woman, actually she wasn't Bushman, she was Khoi Khoi, being on display, uh, be had these very large buttocks and the uh, elongated uh, labia minora. Uh, um, and she was then, when she would die, ex uh, um, um, uh, Cuvier uh, um, dissected her, and her genitals were on display in, 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 in Paris, in Musée, Musée d'Homme, or some, some such museum. <laughs> Anyway, um, so what I'm dealing in this paper is uh, about the why are the Bushmen portrayed as brutal savages, dehumanized, beyond recognition, and then become uh, harmless people, uh, idealized. And I look at the kind of socio-political climate, the zeitgeist that is at work, that favors either the one or the other st stereotype. And this is something, by the way, that I did this in a very early paper that has become, that others have done since, uh, uh, not only in Bushman studies, but I think, I mean, not, not that I take credit for it, but it's, it's, it's all part of, I think, anthropological naval gazing that we have done in anthropology about the whole anthropological enterprise of othering, you know, of, uh, of, of looking at, at the people we study uh, and in the process of doing so, distorting who they are, inventing their cultures, constructing things that aren't there, you know, and including um, stereotypes that unfortunately very often get fastened on by non-anthropologists and get even further uh, boulderized and characterized before you know it, you have um, something like, you know, a, a brutal savage, an inhuman, uh, um, uh, ape-like, uh, uh, anarchical uh, caricature of a human, or it's, it's 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 opposite. You know, <laughs> once these stereotypes that anthropologists, I think, have a have a part in constructing. One, once they leave academia and become part of Hollywood or, or, or popular novels, you know, uh, become uh, uh, exaggerated and to the great detriment of, of the, uh, you know, the Bushmen or the Inuit or wh whomever, you know. We, we, we as anthropologists visit and have the privilege to visit and and, and, and try to understand. Anyway, that's what this paper is about. Myth, and it links up with revisionism, uh, which I will talk about, the revisionism debate, which I will either talk about again later or not. It doesn't really matter because it's a bit of an old horse flogging an old horse. <laughs> um, now, myth and folk tales, uh, I'm, in the context of my fieldwork on, on religion, I, as I said, I collected stories, and I've always had a strong interest in, in, in literature. In fact, almost did my switch into literature for my graduate research. I think I said that already. Um, so w w when I sta collected these stories, when I was in the field in my first visit, I continued with story collecting and the subsequent visits 
and collected enough to put together this, this book of, of texts on Bushman folklore. And in the process also, I entered the discipline of folkloristics. I'm very interested in folklore. And I developed a course um, in, in, in my university career uh, in the subject. I <laughs> even wrote a textbook on folklore, which, however, never got published. It's just as well. Um, so folklore is uh, my s one of my strong interests, in, in it, which is sort of peripheral to anthropology. And in, in the context of, of this, uh, this interest, I put this book together, and I combined the stories I collected amongst the narrow and outlay people, but it's primarily narrow, with the stories of the Kham, the Kham Bushman, the Kham, that's uh, the tend to click X A M, uh, are Bushmen who lived in the Cape, in the right up until the late nineteenth century, when most when they disappeared, uh, either through because they had been uh, there was a genocide against them throughout the eight, seventeenth eighteenth century by these commandos that I mentioned earlier, and also through absorption uh, into, into the uh, gene pool and of, of the, the, the Nama and, and other people. Uh, the so, but they were very much around in the 18th, 19th century. And uh, there is a terrific, beautiful uh, um, collection of archive of stories. As I said, there are about 100 discrete stories and about 85 poems that were collected by Wilhelm Blick, a German linguist, and Lucy Lloyd, uh, uh, his sister-in-law. who is, And they, they recorded this material, which is now, which is housed in the Jagger Library at the University of Cape Town. And I went in 84 and looked at that collection, that archived collection, which has since, by the way, been digitalized and is now available on disk. Um, and it's a UNESCO heritage project, so it's available to anyone. It is an incredible um, trove of, of, of myth texts uh, that, boy, had Livy Strauss ever discovered those, he would have had a field day with, <laughs> he maybe not have written the, uh, the, the uh, uh, his, um, uh, yeah, mythologique on, uh, Amazonians, but on <laughs> on the Bushmen, maybe. <laughs> well, there's a project still for someone, except only about half of the texts have been translated from the Kham language, and the Kham language is dead. You know, so uh, although virtually some, there's hope that it might be rediscovered again. Anyway, but that's another story. Anyway, so I went to the archive and collected, and and took from them. Uh, a number of of stories and put them together in this book. The attempt there being not only to provide uh, a collection of stories, but also to compare the stories with respect to context, to symbolism, to tropes, to see whether or not uh, the argument that has been going on in Khoisan studies for a long time, ever since Isaac Shapiro started it in 1930, do uh, how much of a unit, how much of a homogeneous unit is Bushman culture? I mean, the Bushman, could, I mean, there are only about 100,000 left today. At one time, there may be double that, but there were never many people. But they consist of at least two dozen discrete mutually unintelligible linguistic groups and cultural uh, sort of subgroups, you know. So they're very heterogeneous culturally, linguistically. So the question is, do they constitute a unit uh, when it, with respect to their cosmology, their mythology, you know, their symbolic culture? And this book is one of the attempts of, of dealing with that by looking at the corpus of myth from uh, a Bushman group, the Kham, that existed over 100 years ago, 
a thousand kilometers away from the Kalahari Bushmen today, a different linguistic group altogether. So I look at these stories and then draw comparisons. Something that has been done by other people much better than I, uh, Siegel Schmidt recently did an excellent book along those lines. Uh, the, the, there was always the idea there's the Tram and the rest, that the Tram, about whom there's this beautiful archive, constitute a separate group. And then there's, of course, the other question, do the Bushmen and the Khoi Khoi people, who are pastoral hunter uh, uh, pastoral uh, yellow-skinned clicking people, do they constitute a unit as well? That is uh, obliquely addressed there as well. So that's what that book is about. And in doing this book, I became increasingly interested in Bushman mythology and uh, in Bushman, Bushman art and in Bushman um, um, stories generally, um, oral traditions, i.e. Bushman expressive culture. Dancing, the dance. I, I have a chapter in my pre upcoming book on, on Bushman dance, which very few have done other than trance dance. No one has looked at ludic dancing, which is fascinating too, uh, especially in, with respect to animal transformation. So, uh, the, uh, um, what I'm interested in in two of the papers here, uh, the relationship of Bushman art to ritual and folklore, for example. Convergent and divergent themes in Bushman myth and art deal with that. To what extent are myth and art uh, different, or are they informed with the same themes, cosmological, mythological, symbolic, uh, or are they uh, different artistic enterprises of the Bushman imagination? When, when a story, the stories that draw from myth time, the Bushmen have a very well defined concept of myth, myth time, very similar to dream, dream time in some ways, different in others. But they, they postulate uh, that there was once a, a different order of existence, as they call it, the creation time, when th was was which was an inchoate world where, uh, uh, where everything of chaos, you know, there was no animals and humans where d distinctions weren't drawn uh, clearly. There were, it was inhabited by therianthropes, therianthropic beings, uh, human animal beings, hybrid beings, uh, and the distinction between human and animal and spirit and, and human was, was not drawn. And, um, and this was the, uh, the world of creation um, with extremely uh, unstable ontological boundaries so that people could shift being and identities all, uh, at the drop of a hat. For example, in the course of an argument, the trickster Kui with his wife, which he had all the time, in the course of that argument, as their, their tempers uh, flared, he would change into an elephant and then into a mouse, and she would change into a tree. <laughs> you know, all because they were so excited. And their ontological makeup was, was so precarious still that they could <laughs> change being, you know, just like that. So it was that sort of world. Uh, and um, the... Um, uh, and myths, myths are about that world. Now the question is, what about art? The art, some of the art that the Bushmen create is older than the Upper Paleolithic cave art. The oldest piece of art has been dated to twenty-seven thousand years ago. Yeah, and the rock art is beautiful. Oh, it is. I don't have samples here. Um, uh, they do beautiful polychrome depictions of, of animals of humans and of therianthropic beings, human-animal beings. So the question that uh, a lot of people have asked themselves is Bushman art, the rock art that is some of it thousands of years old, the artists have long ago died, you can't interview them, is that art 
informed with the same themes, the same cosmological and mythological um, figures and and beings and characters and and also does it have the same if you want to look at it in more structuralist symbolic terms, which I'm not doing so much in the present book, it, uh, is it informed with the same thing? And there's a debate here in, in, in sound studies. Some say uh, they're the same, like L Lewis Williams, David Lewis Williams, who is sort of the main voice in, in the Bushman rock art, says the rock art and the myth are both about the same thing, i.e., uh, Trans, trans, the trans state, altered state of consciousness in which the, the the shaman in that state draws potency from the spirit world, and from animals, and from his own being, because potent, the healing potency boils up in his stomach when he heals, when he goes into trance, um, and Lewis Williams sees. Virt sees this as the interpretive key to both myth and art, whereas others, myself included, see myth and art as expressing, yeah, there is overlap, but there are also different expressive domains uh, that deal with different issues. Part of it has to do with simply the production. Of, when you produce art, either by incising it in some of it is engraved and, and sized art. Others is painted. That's a different process, you know. From brain to hand, you use image, not words. You know. So I deal with these 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 questions too. Uh, so so I think art and narrative, art and myth, express different different things. And they have, and the common theme I see in both is transformation, more so than trance, because the th the motif of therianthrop, which is part of the, which is therianthrop, the therianthropic the being, the therianthrop and transformation are the two themes in my present project. Um, they are what. Uh, are predominate in the myth world, this world of inquitness, of chaos, of fluid ontological boundaries. And transformation is also something that the, and I'll get to that again later on, uh, that the trans dancer, yes, one, one of his two experiences is trans, altered state. The other is transformation because he becomes a lion. And I witnessed the lion transformation, and I will uh, describe that maybe later on. And uh, this is why the Inuit stuff is so interesting too, eh? The uh, when Rasmussen and you, you and Austin described transformation into a bear, say, right? Yeah, a bear into a human. And to me, a transformation is what, if there is a common theme to myth. And art, I see it not so much in trance, which is, to me, too too specific, but something more profound, more deeply embedded in cosmology of, of these hunting-gathering people, if not all hunter-gather people, <laughs> i.e. transformation, which is all part of the hunting-gathering, to me. Um, it's part of of the hunter-gathering life way, the hunter-gathering, uh, uh, not just mode of production. The, I also argue, and maybe get to that too, that hunt, hunting-gathering is not just a mode of production or foraging, it's also a mode of thought. There's a, the foraging isn't just something you use to strategically exploit resources to eat, you know, food and, and meat, plants and meat, but it's also a mode of, uh, of thought having to do with, op with, with opportunism, with sharing, with optimization that's there too. It, it isn't just applied to, to resources. 
like Bird David says, you, uh, Nuris Bird David, you forage for relatives. Yeah? Kirk Eddicott says, you forage for ideas. Yeah? Um, so foraging is a, uh, for stories. In my, in my book here, I have a whole section on foraging for stories. Yeah? So foraging um, is, a, is, to me, foraging is, is the foraging, hunting, gathering, hunter gatherers are not a figment, as revisionists would have it, an invention of, of anthropologists. Um, to me, there is something that is discreetly a hunting gathering mode, not just foraging, of so sociality and of thinking. And to me, a core element of this, because the human nature and human animal specifically relationship is so is so so prominent, so salient. Transformation, which is the way of bridging the gap between human and animal, is key you know, to that cosmology. Uh, 